Super Smash Bros. tends to draw from a basic, specific well when it picks fighters. The Nintendo crossover likes to prioritize mascots, icons, protagonists. Its characters tend to be people you've gotten a chance to play, whether in their main games or spin-offs. People you're always going to meet in their stories. Inspiring heroes. And then there's Pokémon. Nintendo's Monster Catching series is one of the world's biggest media properties, and it plays an appropriately major role in Smash Bros. With 10 pocket monsters comprising around 11% of Smash's 89 playable characters, it's contributed more fighters than any other franchise if you count Mario and its spin-offs as separate, at least. Beyond that, the sheer amount of secondary content that's provided makes Pokémon arguably larger and more well-represented than any other series. And yet, outside of the Pokémon trainer, there isn't a protagonist in the bunch. They're all just creatures, a few plucked from hundreds any player can meet. Each generation of Pokémon introduces a massive pool of monsters to collect and train in, so it's popular, marketable beasts that Smash uses, not its human heroes or villains. By contrast, let's look at the other series with many fighters. Super Mario is chock-full of icons, leads, and stars. The fighters of Fire Emblem reflect how their series has a new cast in virtually every game, but they're all main characters. Half of The Legend of Zelda's offerings are variations on its beloved hero. Another thing that distinguishes Pokémon is the sequels the Smash Bros. games use for inspiration. Each Smash roster has to be finalized early, so they tend to reflect the year and era production started. But each game's new Pokémon content, especially new fighters, tends to draw from games that were only released well into production. It makes sense why Smash Bros. director Masahiro Sakurai starts a roster with a blank spot, one reserved for Pokémon to be determined he and his staff will fill later. He's mentioned this process twice, and it's likely happened more. The setup means Sakurai and his staff can't play these games for research, or to pick a fighter, they're not even out yet. Therefore, the process by which Pokémon fighters are added must be different than those of other series. And going by Sakurai's own writings about two Pokémon fighters, each the last picked and youngest of their initial rosters, we can get a decent idea of what that is. In Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, he picked one starter Pokémon over another. And for today's subject, Greninja, he built the character from concept art. Pokémon developer Game Freak provided art assets to the team making Super Smash Bros. for Nintendo 3DS and Wii U, officially before Greninja's games were released. Most likely, it was well before that, before Pokémon X and Y were even announced to the public. The same day the staff chose the Ninja Frog, Sakurai worked until midnight, imagining and crafting its moveset. This falls squarely within the realm of idle speculation, but here's my theory. When each Smash Bros. game starts production, Sakurai puts in a blank spot for a fighter, a Pokémon from an upcoming game. Since he can't play a game that does not yet exist, Game Freak provides him and the staff with concept art of Pokémon the game will introduce. And I suspect they only give a few options, the monsters they plan to give the greatest marketing push. The starter Pokémon you meet first, for instance, are great for that. This kind of curation may seem cynical, but it'd be crazy to ask Sakurai to choose from a pool of dozens. If that's the case, and I think it is, it means Sakurai's pick would be the Pokémon that most appeals to him, to the staff as a whole, as was the case with Greninja, or which they think would best balance the roster. Lucario had a neat gimmick, Incineroar was a fighting game archetype Smash hadn't explored, and Greninja... Well, going off this, we can assume Greninja was chosen from a small pool, probably including its fellow X and Y starters Chestnut and Delphox. They, and plenty of Pokémon, would be great fighters. But I think Greninja got the bump because of what it is, a ninja, that beloved pop culture staple. Greninja draws from a specific, recognizable character type, and I think that type was its appeal. Just think of the tropes we've enjoyed from ninja stories. Japanese swords, throwing stars and knives, wall climbs, stylish scarves, that dumb run from that dumb anime, ninja logs, trap doors, a deadly killer hiding in the shadows. The deadly art of Shinobi has had a global appeal for decades, and it still captures the imagination. This clearly interested Game Freak when they made Greninja, the frog was part of a set. It, Chestnut, and Delphox embodied the three main archetypes of Western role-playing games. In Greninja's case, it's the rogue in the form of a Japanese assassin, albeit a cartoony one. That reflects how it plays in Pokémon X and Y. The ninja Pokémon is incredibly fast, hits hard, and has paper-thin defenses. And naturally, that informs how it plays in Smash, but the fighting game takes it much further. Not just fast and deadly, the amphibious assassin is an almost platonic ideal of the pop culture ninja. It has disappearing powers and secret logs and, of course, an obscenely sized throwing star. All it's missing is the call drops. It should be noted that this wasn't Smash's first ninja. She got there first and still keeps it real. But Cheek's comparatively toned down, more subtle. She's not a giant frog with a tongue for a scarf. The so-called master of stealth is pretty eye-catching. 
Greninja's best feature is its breathtaking mobility. It walks, runs, and strikes quickly. Its attacks and dodges are quick as well, letting it move in and out of foe's range. Those, and most of its moves, have a good range of their own, and a short lag that lets it stay on the offensive. And its air game, complete with great attacks, a fast air speed, and second highest jump in the cast, is superb. It's all for keeping pace, supported by how three of its four special attacks involve movement in some way. Even its counter substitute uniquely sends it flying. The frog gets around, able to throw out a kick, grab, or whack with few downsides. Greninja's specials are also important for allowing cutting ruses of all sorts. It wields an excellent projectile in Water Shuriken, which takes up space and comes out fast. Hydro Pump is a poor attack, but an excellent recovery, one that can be used for tricks in the air or on the ground. And the incredibly unique Shadow Sneak, a move straight out of the Ninja playbook, is especially wild. It involves Greninja teleporting through its own shadow, leaping out with a satisfying kick. These keep opponents on the run and the Pokémon in pursuit. The counterpoint to these skills is some truly terrible defense. My favorite Smash Fighter is kind of a dink when it comes to gaining ground. It can be comboed easily, partially due to its low weight, and it lacks options for hitting opponents right after lowering its shield. It even looks goofy as it's knocked about, a good reminder that even with that shinobi cool, it's still a cute, silly frog. Weaknesses are important mechanically for the sake of balance, but they're also helpful for maintaining themes. In Greninja's case, they encourage, strongly encourage, an offensive playstyle. It does not behoove a master of ninjutsu to play defense, and the frog's skills don't do well at retaking the flow of battle. So the goal has to be twofold, always press forward and never never show an opening. Even Greninja's retreats need to be quick, aggressive, and merely the start of another attack. Ideally, Greninja will be fast, aggressive, but always tricky. It'll liberally use all the tools it has, from wide-ranging attacks to abilities that let it zoom across the stage. And it'll constantly mix things up with mind games, always with the intent to keep opponents off guard. Plenty of flourishes only add more weight to that. Greninja's final smash starts with trapping foes in a tatami mat and ends with a rush of blows under the glow of a full moon. Its water swords are katanas in Smash 4 and kunai in Ultimate. Substitute makes sure to throw out a log, an inscrutable but beloved ninja trope, and its three-point stance gives it more anime ninja flair than most actual anime ninjas. I believe this is the core of Greninja, a style birthed from a popular trope. Smash 4 looked at the realm of Shokasugi, Snake Eyes, and Ryu Hayabusa, and it liked what it saw. And no matter the reasoning behind its inclusion, things clearly worked out. Initially a controversial pick, the frog's cool style won players over. It became popular casually and competitively, and it even got to be the only Pokémon needed to beat Ultimate its story mode. An odd honor, certainly. Smash is just one facet of Greninja's fame. It got a plum role in the anime, some of whose visual elements Ultimate incorporated, the Detective Pikachu movie, and several spin-offs. This could all be seen as a cynical marketing ploy, and maybe it is, but I don't think that's fair. Greninja's initial popularity came from Pokémon X and Y players encountering it on their own. Game Freak deliberately kept it out of pre-release marketing. And Greninja's popularity in Smash came the same way. Players tried it, and players liked it. But I also think that it's time in Smash, a huge honor in its own right, to be sure, is special even still because Smash lets players explore that style directly. Unlike the turn-based fighting of Pokémon or the non-interactive cartoons, players got to viscerally, actively express its ninja ways, that mixture of dark cool and phenomenal goofiness. Training Greninja in Pokémon is fun, but playing Greninja is wild. It's exciting every time this pocket monster, tropes in hand, leaps out to sneak and slice its way to victory. Thanks for watching! If you like this video, definitely check out more of our work. We'd also love any support you could give us on Patreon. To our Patreons on screen, thank you so much. Goodbye, and remember to return to the source.